You have entered into the black hole of real estate, a place for industry news, tips, and strategies. Once you enter into our vortex, even if you could leave, you're probably going to want to stick around. I'm your host, Ron Weissakarski, and you are now entering the black hole of real estate. Welcome back to the Beach Condo Edition. I'm excited to be talking about what it's looking like when you are purchasing that beach condo and what is going on with that Airbnb type of market that's super, super hot right now. Um, rentals versus flips, let's face it. Uh, is the flip market dead? Um, we're going to talk about that in context and tie it into some of the stuff that's going on with condos as well. And then finally, the FISBO market. You know, let's face it. Since houses are selling themselves, do you actually even need to hire a realtor? I'm going to save that for the end. And right now, let's talk about condo sales in general. You know, they've been up and down a little bit this year, and I think there's a really good, easy reason for it. There was pent-up demand in sales earlier in the year, and it took a while to close some of these things. And post-election, there was some stuff going on. There was supply chain stuff going on. And really, you know, the vaccines hadn't really hit, so to speak. So there was some ebb and flow with the condo sales. There's a number of people that wanted to sell them but couldn't get, you know, to them because maybe their second homes couldn't travel to them, get them ready, or, or just remove their possessions, you know, the things they want to take with them. A lot of people had personal things. It just took a while to work out their vacations and work to get down, you know, to places like Florida and actually get them emptied out and ready to sale. So I think that had something to do with the sales earlier in the year. I think qualifying was different for some people this year for mortgages that, that actually were financing because they're waiting on tax returns. And, of course, all the differences in business last year affected the way people qualify. And then finally, some of these were actually still rented. And the tenants that were in place, those those leases survive the sale of the property. So when the property sells, you just can't boot the tenant out. That lease does survive it. So a lot of these sales had to wait in order to close. They could have gone under contract in January, February, and March, but maybe maybe not closed until April or May. So we're seeing some some lag time in some of these sales. So as far as you know, condo sales, you know, it, if you think of the Daytona Beach market, they're was about 200 sales each in the month of April and May, and a few more in April, which I believe was that easing of the ones that were waiting to close from the rentals, but May was still strong. And historically, we see a little bit of a drop in the summertime because, again, the summer rentals kick in, and other people are using them or getting them ready. So there's a couple different condo seasons is what I would say. But it's very, very strong right now. I mean, it's double what it was last year. And if you think about you know, last April, those were the sales that occurred, you know, and went under contract, you know, prior to any lockdowns or COVID like that. So last year we saw 80-ish, 90 in April and May. This year, 250 and 200. So, you know, two to three times that. So the condo market certainly is back and it's strong. It was perhaps a little bit depressed last year, but this was going into the lockdown. Those sales are already on the books, so they were closing. And I think you'll see some dicey numbers when we compare year over year, June and July, because there just wasn't a ton of activity after the lockdown times last year. Now, what do we see right now? Median sales price always jumps up and down over condos. It just does. And it's simply stated, if a bunch of direct ocean fronts sell, they sell for more. If it's side view, they sell for a little bit less. Or if it's just street view or across the street where you walk across A1A, well, those are going to sell for less. So depending on what's you know the flavor of the month, those medium prices will fluctuate and there really isn't an indicator that says, okay, based on only direct ocean front home sales, here's the number. And then based on the ones that are street view across the street, here's a different number. And then let's slice up condo tells. And then from building to building, we can have a brand new building next door to one that's 50 years old. So there's not a commonality that we're going to put our fingers on. It gets super specific, super fast in condos. But if we just compare just the raw number, the median sales price is up. A lot. And last year was in that probably that 160 range to 200. And now we're looking at 240 to 275. So it's up dramatically. And I think that's the story. Sales are up. Prices are up. It's not news, but there's facts. And that is helping the condo market continue to move forward. The inventory is, you know, paper thin, I guess is what I would say. 
at this time, there's almost nothing to buy, but that's not news. What I can say is year to date, if you go just take it through the end of May, in 2020, there was about 500 condo sales. This year is over 1,000. So it's double what it was last year. And the median sales price during that first five months of the year, 205 last year, about 260 this year. So both are good numbers to hang your hat on. So if you're in that condo market or thinking of anything condo related, yeah, you know, there's some evidence out there that it's going to cost a little bit more to get into that. And I think when we talk about the sales stats of condos, it leads me into a place that I get excited about. And that's, you know, what do we do? We want to make investments. Is flipping dead? And what about these rentals? Are they long-term? Are they Airbnb? And while they don't seem like they have much to do with each other, I think they have everything to do with each other. And why is that? Well, let's start with the flipping thing. We've talked about how this year flips, the national statistics are showing that about 2.75% of property sold their flips. Last year at this time, 7.5%, historically around 10 So there's a lot less flips going on. And if you're in the market of renovating properties, your options are pretty limited. You can battle it out and perhaps overpay or threaten your margins and hope that there's no correction in the market and be aggressive and keep buying and then flip the property or just be really good at it. Some people are on the sidelines. They've done everything from buy stocks to Bitcoin. Some just put some cash in a bank waiting for when prices might eventually drop, if they do. The other thing is they're repositioning. I say, okay, if we're not flipping, what else is a hot market? And that kind of takes us over to the other side. Well, what about Airbnb? That seems to be a lot of money. And people are killing it in that. What if we convert all of this energy we're putting into flipping the houses? What if we just renovate it enough or buy one ready to go for a rental and reverse the flow of cash going out to cash going in? Well, on, on the, on, on the short-term rental side, let's just say one week or less, you need everything in Florida from a city license, business tax license, one for the county, and uh, one for the state, a hotel license, believe it or not, you know, for life, for rentals 30 days or less. Now, does everybody have that yet? I, I imagine everybody out there is on the way to getting those that they don't have those. We'll just cover it that way. And if you put the insurances in place and whatnot, I think that as you investigate the true costs and travel is opening up and you can either have your own website or you know, some booking method to get rentals in there. It's a pretty clean way to do it. As long as you have a way to get people in checked in, checked out and clean the place up for the next one, you can assemble this and you probably could do it from home once you get it rolling and that might be a nice business. So a flipper might go towards the short-term rental business, but I also know some of the flippers are going in and buying a home that has rental income. It's like an instant annuity. You go pay a couple hundred thousand dollars for a property, and maybe it's renting fifteen hundred, two grand, somewhere in there, and you've got money coming back in, you know, almost immediately. And that's been a path where I've seen a progression for people that were flipping properties to moving into the short-term rental space. They're just saying, you know what, there's pretty good money in renting long term, removing a lot of the risk and energy, and also taking out some of the other issues like supply chain. You know, can we even get the materials? You know, flipping a property, it matters to be able to get your materials quickly. And getting it done in three months instead of eight months is a big difference because all the carrying costs are taxes and insurance and markups and corrections and you know, let's hope the market doesn't change. It's, it's a long time to be hanging out there and waiting for it to happen. And on the short-term rental site, you you know, who knows? I, I think we're okay. We're, you know, a lot of the country is getting vaccinated. People are traveling. I don't think this is a very, I mean, there's probably some variations of, of viruses out there, but I, I think people are traveling. And as long as you're keeping up with cleanliness and standards as a way to do this, you need to put a team together for cleanliness and check-ins and check-outs, but you can do the short-term rental piece. And it's kind of exciting. I, I see an energy with that piece where, you know, when you're buying and flipping, there's an energy, there's an excitement. Did you get the house? You get to see it get recreated. You get to see how wonderful it looks after you're all done. And you 
get some profit at the end. Well, to replace that euphoric, you know, feeling, you know, the short-term rental, you get that gratification. Hey, I got another rental. Got another review. Here comes another one. Pay a small cleaning fee. Boom, next one, next one. So it's a continuous cycle, and that could be energizing and invigorating. When either or both of those become less exciting or more risky, I think a lot of people are going back to old-fashioned investing where they buy a property and they lease it out on an annual basis. It's a normalized return. It's very, very predictable, a lot less risk. And occasionally, you're going to have somebody moving out. But if you're doing your homework up front and you're getting great applications and you're doing background checks and credit checks, you minimize a lot of your risk. There's nothing perfect or guaranteed in the rental business, but it's a lot more predictable. Most of the work on the rental is on the front end. And then 10, 11 months later, you're looking at a renewal or a changeover. So depending on how many moving parts that you want, you know, the flipping game, it's fast paced and it's a hustle. And it's, I don't know, it's like jumping off a cliff sometimes. And that's okay. And I, I believe that if you're in that market and you're looking to replace that excitement, it, it, hey, it might be Bitcoin or the stock market or day trading. <laughs> I'm not sure which one of those is going to be the easy one in the mix. But if you're looking to replace income, then short-term rental certainly is a way to get your income over time. And it's still pretty exciting. And if you're just looking to make money, and flipping was a way that you could do it, and now it's less likely or less easy or less profitable, all of a sudden, the long-term appreciation of a property combined with rental income every month, it's a pretty viable source. And while I haven't tracked it, with great energy, I know this. If you flip a property, you're going to have taxes short term. I mean, it's, it's not likely you're going to take a year to flip a property. So it's going to be into this year's tax return. So even though you might be making 50000 by the time you pay 20, 30%, whatever that is, you know, 10 or 15, then that might go to Uncle Sam, depending on how you're looking at your cost basis and what your CPA or however you're doing your taxes factors in, all of a sudden, the appreciation and the tax treatment of a long-term investment for a, a property that rents on an annual basis, it gets more interesting. I, there's a lot of ways to approach your wealth building through real estate. And by far, the most sexiest thing out there is flipping houses. I mean, that's why they have so many TV shows on it. We don't see a lot of TV shows about short-term rentals, and we definitely don't see a lot of TV shows that talk about, hey, I'm going to buy this property and sit on it for 25 years and just rent it out you know, once a year to different people. So the sexiness isn't there. But when you examine the numbers, some of our clients are finding out that slow and steady is winning the race. And while it's not as sexy as glitzy, there's a lot less risk. And with lifestyles being what they are right now, it's it's a lot less work on a monthly basis. It might be a few minutes a month is all it takes. So a lot of ways to approach these investments. There's not a right or a wrong way. There's just that. And it's interesting how it's playing out. You know, the last thing I want to talk about is for sale by owner. And if you're doing it, congratulations. We used to have a sit, we were told and taught over the years at about 15%, maybe it's a little bit less. People sell on their own or are actually successful and they do it. We also hear a statistic that the vast majority of people net less money when they do it on their own. And we, we've always been given some statistics of why that's possible. Maybe it's limited marketing or lack of negotiating skills or perhaps missing something through a second negotiation on inspections. Or maybe they get to the finish line and there's some buyer situation where they can't purchase the home unless something happens. Or maybe just get held, you know, bent over a barrel. You're days away from putting a couple hundred grand in your pocket and the buyer suddenly changes their mind and you entice them back in with five or 10 or $20,000 to make sure you get the deal done because, Hey, 190 is better than not getting the 200 and I don't want to wait 30 days. These sort of things happen in that market. So a lot of times someone will net less money. Just a fact. Uh, they don't necessarily have the reach or the marketing or the, the time. There's probably 150 things they estimate that happen during for sale by owner process. But let's suppose that you nailed all of those and you are selling it on your own and you're one of the 15% that does that and you didn't miss anything. You know, the other side is that 
somewhere it's, there's a statistic that will tell you that 75 percent of all lawsuits occur when somebody's not represented by a real estate professional or an attorney uh, it's been given to me over the years i've seen a number of places i how verifiable that is i'm not sure but i think the, the point is that there's probably more risk whether it's 75 percent of lawsuits or whatever that number might be so you know what do they call those wives tales we've been handed these numbers over the years I would just say that there's an overconfidence in this market among the for sale by owner crowd. You know, the number one thing they're doing is they're trying to net the most amount of money, which means they might be looking to pay less commission. And we can't talk about specifically what the going rate is because there's no such thing. There's a lot of legalese out there that will tell you there's no price fixing, so don't talk about commission. But let's just suppose that someone's going to sell it on their own, sell their home all by themselves. And through the work of a network of realtors, maybe they're willing to invest a certain amount for a commission to a realtor. What we find is that they're willing to pay something, but maybe not the whole thing to have somebody do the whole process from start to finish. And that difference between what they'd be willing to pay is a finder's fee through a legal real estate commission through a brokerage with signed agreements and everything compliant versus what they might pay to get full service to have somebody ask to list market and sell the property on their behalf with fiduciary responsibilities. You know, that, that difference is what they're avoiding to make more money. And a lot of people can do that. The problem is, is that you may not be aware of the gigantic market shifts that have occurred in the last few months and what might occur in the next few months. So let's break that down. Let's suppose that you are going to sell your home for $300,000 and you were going to put it on the market in February. And for whatever reason, you didn't do it until March or April. And since you're not in the business and you're not aware through sales and negotiation on other properties with other families, that maybe that $300,000 property is going for three ten dollars or three twenty, dollars or maybe, and you're probably not aware of contracts that are pending within the brokerage firm, but, you know, certainly as a broker, I can see all of the pending. So I know in advance what some of the sales prices at closing are going to be in specific neighborhood because that's the compliance paperwork I do. So I'm going to see that. So if you're selling by yourself and the only thing that you have is going online to check values or, you know, plucking some number out of the air for yourself, if you're not aware of a dramatic market shift or a need or another client, you may think that you're paying less commission and saving money but the biggest mistake is pricing your home wrong. And sometimes it's pricing it lower because, hey, the buyers know that you're going to sell for less money because there's no realtor fees involved or less involved. So buyers know there's no, there's no hiding that. I think as a, as a consumer, if you see a for sale by owner, you think, okay, I should be able to get a discount here because there's no brokerage involved. Okay, that's great. But if you're underpricing it because you're not aware of market conditions ramping up dramatically, you might have avoided the commission, but you might have lost thousands of dollars more than you saved because you priced it too low. Now, the other side of it is if you price it too high, you're going to get a lot of activity, and then you just play realtor for a while. You know, oh, they're all tire kickers, or they're, they're going to get back to me. That, that's, you know, they're just all looky-loos. They, they have to pay my price or else. So, okay. At some point, the buyer just has a choice to buy something else. So if you're for sale by owner, and you're lingering on the market for a month or two, it's probably your marketing or lack of it. It's probably your pricing, and it could just be your demeanor. There is an overconfidence out there, and a number of the for sale by owners that I'm witnessing right now are their, their future pacing. Okay, the one down the street sold for $350. i am going to price mine at $360. Not factoring in that unless you've seen the other property and you know that apples to apples, you're a far superior home you may not get that it's really just relevance and understanding the market at a super clear super high level of what value is to consumers and what their behaviors are so on a for sale by owner thing can you sell it on your own i think anybody can put a sign in the front yard and i think a lot of people can attract a buyer and i believe a lot of people can somehow find a form or a way to write down what's going to happen. Now, maybe you're going to pay for an attorney or someone to do that. But, you know, 
if you're using the wrong form, you may have something in there that may harm you down the road or may cause the buyer to back out. I mean, knowing the forms and the contracts is going to be a super important thing, but let's suppose you navigate all of that as well and you find a closing agent. You've just got to get through all the steps. And very quickly, we find that some people are highly compensated and to save a few grand, they're taking a month off from work where they make even more money. So again, what a seller will net for sale by owner's market, factoring all things in, may not be the big savings they thought it was going to be or the big increase in their pocket, so to speak. And there's a couple dangers out there. So this is not a warning to only hire an agent. It isn't. A lot of people are very successful selling on their own, and they'll, and they'll continue to do it. But I think the overconfidence is the biggest thing I see right now. And I'd be careful about pricing your property too high and not selling over what is the super hot market right now. And it doesn't mean the prices are going down or up. It doesn't mean any of that. It just means it's hot right now. And it, if you're thinking of selling, I think you'd want to take advantage of the known quantity of a super hot market now versus the unknown down the road. All right, so that's what I have for you. You know, scary stuff under for sale by owner. Uh, rentals, flips, you know, flips, I don't think they're dead. They're on life support right now, and there's not many happening. They're still out there, though. Slow and steady winning the race on the long-term rentals and kind of coming back in fashion. And uh, condos, pretty exciting stuff. I, I hope that you guys enjoyed this and learned a little bit out of this. Um, drop us a comment below. Hit the subscribe button. And appreciate you guys stopping in. This is Ron Wysikarski for the Black Hole of Real Estate.